So Power Platform environments have been around for a while, and maybe you're using them, maybe you're not. Uh, I can tell you that if you're not using them, you may be getting to a point where you're getting a little bit worried about all of the apps and flows and things like that that are cropping up in your environment uh, from all of the different users that you have. So today I want to talk about how you can use environments to make that situation a lot better. So today we're talking about environments in the Power Platform with the hopes of helping to demystify it a little bit for you and kind of give you some insight uh, and ideas on new ways that you can use the Power Platform in your organization. If you don't know what environments are, you can kind of think of them like containers around your applications or your data. Uh, so think of setting up a secure boundary, if you will, around certain pieces of data the organization owns or uh, setting up a specific environment for an application or a, or a specific purpose within your organization. Um, and that's really kind of the gist of what environments are. The first place you might notice environments is going to be inside of Power Automate or Power Apps. Uh, and if you're paying attention at all, you might see in the upper right hand corner, you might see a little drop down that'll tell you what environment you're using. And if you have more than one environment, that drop down will have those listed. Uh, so if you have access to multiple, they'll show up there. By default, you're just going to have a single environment automatically set up in your Office 365 uh, tenant for your organization. Um, and usually it's referred to as the default environment for your organization. So while we're talking about the default environment, let's kind of lay that out uh, and what it's for uh, before we move on to other areas. So right off the bat, any user added to your organization is automatically going to be added to the default environment. It's where they will do things like personal automation. Um, it's where their basic approval flows will take place or if any approvals that they receive will all happen there. So that's where all of the basic Power Automate and Power App stuff will take place. Part of the default environment is also Dataverse. If you are getting yourself to a point where you're like, I need a new data entity in Dataverse, or I want to add some fields to an existing entity, um, that's when you want to start thinking about using a separate environment. So rather than customize the existing default environment, be thinking about creating those customizations in a separate environment. So let's talk about some of the reasons for creating separate environments in the Power Platform. So one of the first reasons that you might want to extend or create a separate environment in Power Platform is in the scenario that you need to extend the Dataverse. So by default, in that default environment, you're going to get an instance of Dataverse, which is basically just a cloud database, um, is, is a good way to think about it. And it's the thing that kind of sits on the back end behind Teams and behind uh, approvals and behind Power Automate and Power Apps and all of those things can use Dataverse. When you get yourself into a scenario where you, let's say, have uh, some sort of customization that you need done either to approvals or to some entity within the Dataverse, you're very quickly going to find yourself with a need to put that in a separate environment uh, such that you're not actually customizing or making changes to that default environment. This is important because once you make changes to Dataverse, um, you can have some impact on some of the out-of-the-box behavior uh, that your users might experience when they're using the default environment and you don't really want to impact them. So Microsoft gives us the ability to create environments so that we can extend things like Dataverse. So whenever you uh, create an environment, one of the choices you get is whether or not to add Dataverse to it. So if you are using Dataverse for your application purpose or for some other data need, um, you'll want to add a Dataverse instance to that new environment, and then you can customize that environment. So whenever I'm leveraging uh, Microsoft technology to do something on my own or do something a little bit different, I always like to look at the models uh, or the examples that Microsoft provides. And so when we're thinking about extending the Power Platform, creating a new environment, um, there are some good examples out there that Microsoft provides as kind of models for how we should uh, do that ourselves or how we should think about building apps within the Power Platform. One of those is Microsoft Dynamics. Uh, so if, if any of you are familiar with Dynamics, Dynamics is basically a CRM solution that has many different facets, but it all lives on top of Dataverse. And whenever you uh, stand up a Dynamics instance, whenever you issue yourself some licenses and you get that going, one of the first things you're going to find is that the Dynamics instance is actually uh, deployed to or installed in a separate environment. It'll never be installed to your default environment. So when you're thinking about building other applications for your own organization purposes or any customization of, of you know, Dataverse or anything like that, look at that Dynamics example. Like there's a reason they did that um, and it makes a lot of sense to put that in a separate environment. Another good example that Microsoft provides of this type of extension where they're using a separate environment to build a separate application with a distinct purpose is something called the Power Platform Center of Excellence or PPCOE and this is something that's free. Microsoft has provided this kind of due to demand in the community for more ability to manage 
power platform applications and solutions. And so what the PPCOE is designed for is literally to allow administrators in an Office 365 environment to monitor and uh, provide an approval mechanism and just manage all of the different applications and flows, all of those things that are happening within the Power Platform within your tenant. This is a really good example because um, it creates a separate environment. You install the PPCOE solution um, and you're actually creating boundaries for a couple different reasons. One of those boundaries is security. So the primary users of this particular solution are usually your IT administrators, uh, those types of folks. You're not letting everybody use this solution. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting uh, that the PPCOE teaches us is that the solution as deployed in that separate environment actually has access to all of the data and content in all of the other environments within your organization. And that's how it keeps track of and monitors everything that's going on, any requests for new applications, anything like that, it's able to do that. So it's a really great example. Um, it kind of shows the ability to create applications within an environment um, that can interact throughout your organization um, on any of the data that's there while still securing that application for its own purpose. So the last thing I want to mention before we move on from these kind of application uh, examples in, in, that use Dataverse is that Dataverse is not a requirement uh, for your environment. So you can create an environment that does not have Dataverse in it. Um, so if you have no need for that data, let's say if you're using SQL Server as your data backend or maybe SharePoint uh, as your data backend, um, you can completely leave Dataverse out of the question um, and just have that environment. Uh, to build flows and power apps in without Dataverse. All right, so the next thing that I'd like to point out about uh, using environments are some of the additional benefits that you get from the environments that Microsoft lets us use in the Power Platform. Uh, so if you have any sort of traditional software development background, you might be familiar with the app dev lifecycle. Uh, so the whole idea that you, uh, your developers create something, uh, they build the features, they fix bugs, they then push it to a testing environment where your QA team can validate it. Um, and then ultimately once it's you know, complete and tested and valid, uh, you're able to push it to a production environment for your end users to actually consume. So environments actually gives us that ability. We can create an environment for those three specific purposes um, where your developers can go and you know, build your applications, make changes, fix bugs, all of those types of things. Um, you can then take all of those parts that they built and pick those up and deploy them to a test environment or take them and deploy them to a production environment. Um, and so that's one of the, the main benefits um, that you can have by using environments. In addition to that, you should be thinking about the use of environments for application-specific purposes. So if you, you're building a large application um, where you want to be able to kind of contain all of the parts and pieces of that in one place, uh, control the security to it and all of those types of things, having it within an environment gives you that nice clean container uh, to wrap around it uh, for that reason. Oh, and one other thing I forgot to mention when it comes to the app dev life, life cycle, uh, be aware that there are things built into environments like solutions or environment variables, for example, that you can use to help manage that move from your dev environment to your test environment to your production environment. So you can have an environment variable, for, for example, that signifies what the environment is for and the application can behave differently depending on where it's deployed. Another benefit of environments uh, is that they can be used in large organizations to help segment or secure data uh, or purpose uh, appropriately. So if you think about a scenario where you have, let's say, a large hospital organization, they're going to have all kinds of data. They're going to have uh, run-of-the-mill uh, data about inventory, uh, but then they're also going to have data that is very sensitive, like PHI, right, that patient health information. And that needs to be secured in a very specific way, uh, according to all of the regulations that we have. And so setting up environments specific to an inventory purpose for a hospital versus a PHI purpose for a hospital can be very beneficial and provide a way uh, to keep that data secure in a way that meets all of the, the regulatory requirements. In addition to that, some other large organizations like municipalities or state governments, for example, might have a multi multitude of agencies within where you want to allow those agencies the ability to kind of act autonomously. And so based on the different culture and the different agencies and their uh, role and responsibility within government, you can dedicate specific environments to each agency, thereby giving them the ability to control their data and their applications as they see fit uh, within that large organization. It's important to note that at the top level, at, uh, you, at the organization level, you can dictate certain minimum standards for the security requirements or for encryption and things like that. Um, and so you can kind of lock that down from a top level, but then still within each environment allow specific uh, and customized use for those agencies. 
All right, so the last thing that I wanted to drop on you is a little pro tip. So you may or may not be familiar with, with this concept at all, but it's important to note that tight integration between Office 365, so things like SharePoint, for example, and the Power Platform is only doable currently through the default environment. So uh, think of examples where you're uh, automating a particular approval flow from a SharePoint list or library. Um, and if you're allowing the user, user to do that manually, they're selecting that little Power Automate menu and then they're getting a choice of basically menu options uh, to fire off an approval process for that document or list item. Uh, in that particular case, if your flow is not built in the default environment, it will not work. Um, so that's an example uh, where you need that tight integration. So if you're expecting to build a separate environment and move all of those flows, for example, that are coming off of a SharePoint document library, um, manual trigger, you sh cannot do that. You need to put, keep those in the default environment. You can still run regular automated flows, so flows that are triggered based on when a document is created, when a document is modified, uh, or when a list item is modified. Those are just fine in any environment you choose. It's just those manual integrations, so the menu items that appear in the SharePoint list or library. The other thing to note is that if you're doing any SharePoint list uh, form customization using Power Apps, those things are extra special. They also never are deployed to any environment but the default environment and they're very tightly integrated with SharePoint. So those are just a couple little things that'll hopefully save you some time if you find yourself in that world and you're thinking that you can put those in a separate environment. Um, just reference this little video and give yourself a reminder that you cannot do that. All right, so that's all we have today on environments in the Power Platform. Uh, but there's a lot more to this subject. Uh, we've got a couple things we're going to talk about in the future, uh, one being app dev lifecycle and, and how that can work inside of the Power Platform using environments. Another one is P the PPCOE, which I mentioned, uh, which is a much bigger topic, and so we'll be uh, coming out with that pretty soon. If you're interested in those upcoming videos or more of this type of content, be sure to like and subscribe for more. Before we're done, there's a few other things that I just want to remind you of. Uh, we have a Make Others Successful podcast where we discuss topics uh, like this uh, and other ones that are related uh, in this space. Uh, we also have a learning center on our website where you can go consume more of this content if you're interested in improving your skills or just kind of coming along. Uh, with us as, as we uh, produce more content. And then finally, we've been getting questions on some of our YouTube videos where we try to answer them uh, usually uh, in just a response with a comment, um, but some of those are a little bit more complex. And so we've started an office hours, which is the first Wednesday of every month uh, that you can kind of come and uh, join. And if you have those types of questions, you can ask them there. Uh, it's free of charge for about an hour a month, and we'll try to do our best to answer any questions that you have in, in that form. And that's it for now, and I look forward to seeing you next time.